Nursing care patients with musculoskeletal disorders. Osteoporosis. In the early stages of bone loss, usually the patient will have no pain or other symptoms. But once bones have been weakened by osteoporosis, the symptoms include back pain, which can be severe if fractured or collapsed vertebra, loss of height over time with an accompanying stoop posture, fracture of the vertebra, wrist, hips, or other bones, often termed the silent disease because there are no symptoms. Since no symptoms, the usual first signs are back pain and spontaneous fractures. Osteopenia is more than normal bone loss, but not yet at the level of osteoporosis. Osteoporosis medications. Biphosphonates. Much like estrogen, this group of drugs can inhibit bone breakdown, preserve bone mass, and even increase bone density in the spine and hip, reducing the risk of fractures. Biphosphonates may be especially beneficial for men, young adults, and people with steroid-induced osteoporosis. They're also used to treat osteoporosis in people who require long-term steroid treatment for disease such as asthma or arthritis. Evista. This medication belongs to a class of drugs called selective estrogen receptor modulators. Evista mimics estrogen's beneficial effects on bone density in postmenopausal women without some of the risks associated with estrogen, such as increased risk of uterine cancer and possibly breast cancer. Hot flashes are a common side effect of Evista and shouldn't use this drug if a history of blood clots. This drug is approved only for women with osteoporosis and is not currently approved for use in men. Calcitonin. A hormone produced by the thyroid gland, calcitonin reduces bone resorption and may slow bone loss. It may also prevent spine fractures and may even provide some pain relief from compression fractures. It is usually administered as a nasal spray and causes nasal irritation in some people who use it, but it's also available as an injection. Because calcitonin isn't as potent as biphosphonates, it's normally reserved for people who can't take other drugs. Forteo. This powerful drug, an analog of parathyroid hormone, treats osteoporosis in postmenopausal women and men who are at high risk of fractures. Unlike other available therapies for osteoporosis, it works by stimulating new bone growth as opposed to preventing further bone loss. Forteo is given once a day by injection under the skin on the thigh or abdomen. Long-term effects are still being studied, so the FDA recommends restricting therapy to two years or less. Tamoxifen. This synthetic hormone is used to treat breast cancer and is given to certain high-risk women to help reduce their chances of developing breast cancer. Although tamoxifen blocks estrogen's effect on breast tissue, it is an estrogen-like effect on other cells in the body, including the bone cells. As a result, tamoxifen appears to reduce the risk of fractures, especially in women older than 50. Possible side effects of tamoxifen include hot flashes, stomach upset, and vaginal dryness or discharge. Ask about eye and ear disorders that may increase the risk of falls. Describe any dizziness, joint pain, numbness, or shortness of breath that affects the walk. Consider changing the footwear as part of fall prevention plan. High heels, floppy slippers, and shoes with slick soles can make the patient slip, stumble, and fall. So can walking in stocking feet. Instead, buy properly fitting sturdy shoes with non-skid soles. Avoid shoes with extra thick soles and choose lace-up shoes instead of slip-ons and keep the laces tied. Select footwear with fabric fasteners if they have trouble tying the laces. Tell them to shop at the men's department if a woman who can't find wide enough shoes. If bending over to put on the shoes puts them off balance, consider a long shoehorn that helps them slip the shoes on without bending over. As part of fall prevention measures, look around the living room, kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, hallways, and stairways may be filled with booby traps. Clutter can get in the way, so remove boxes, newspaper, electrical cords, and phone cords from walkways. Move coffee tables, magazine racks, and plant stands from high traffic areas. Secure loose rugs with double-faced tape, tacks, or a slip-resistant backing. Repair loose wooden floorboards and carpeting right away. Store clothing, dishes, food, and other household necessities within easy reach. Immediately clean spilled liquids, grease, or food. Use non-skid floor wax and use non-slip mats in the bath or shower. Light up the living space. As we get older, less light reaches the back of the eyes where we sense color and motion. 
so keep the home brightly lit with 100 watt bulbs or higher to avoid tripping on objects that are hard to see. Don't use bulbs that exceed the wattage rating on lamps and lighting fixtures since this can present a fire hazard. Also, place a lamp near the bed and within reach. Make clear paths to light switches that aren't near room entrances. Consider installing glow-in-the-dark or illuminated switches. Place night lights in the bedrooms, bathrooms, and hallways. Use assisted devices. Recommend using a cane or walker to keep steady. Other assisted devices can help too. Grab bars mounted inside and just outside the shower or bathtub. A raised toilet seat or one with armrests to stabilize themselves. A sturdy plastic seat placed in the shower or tub so they can sit down if needed. Buy a handheld shower nozzle so that the patient can shower sitting down. Normal versus osteoporotic bone. Diseases associated with osteoporosis are intestinal malabsorption, kidney disease, rheumatoid arthritis, hyperthyroidism, chronic alcoholism, cirrhosis of the liver, diabetes mellitus. Risk factors. Fractures from osteoporosis are about twice as common in women as they are in men. That's because women start out with a lower bone mass and tend to live longer. They also experience a sudden drop in estrogen at menopause that accelerates bone loss. Slender, small frame women are particularly at risk. Men who have lower levels of the male hormone testosterone also are at risk, increased risk. The risk of osteoporosis in men is greatest from age 75 on. Age. The older one gets, the higher the risk of osteoporosis because the bones become weaker. Race. Greatest risk of osteoporosis if Caucasian or of Southeast Asian descent. Family history. Osteoporosis runs in families. For that reason, having a parent or sibling with osteoporosis puts at greater risk. Frame size. Men and women who are exceptionally thin or have small body frames tend to have higher risk because they may have less bone mass to draw from as they age. Tobacco use. The exact role of tobacco plays in osteoporosis isn't clearly understood, but researchers do know that tobacco use contributes to weak bones. Lifetime exposure to estrogen. The greater a woman's lifetime exposure to estrogen, the lower her risk of osteoporosis. Eating disorders. Women and men with anorexia nervosa or bulimia are at higher risk for lower bone density in their lower backs and hips. Corticosteroid medication. Long-term use of corticosteroid medications such as prednisone, cortisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone is damaging to bones. These medications are common treatments for chronic conditions such as asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriasis. If the patient needs to take a steroid medication for long periods, they should monitor the bone density and recommend other drugs to help prevent bone loss. Thyroid hormone. Too much thyroid hormone also can cause bone loss. This can occur either because the thyroid is overactive, hyperthyroid, or because taking excess amounts of thyroid hormone medication to treat an underactive thyroid, like hypothyroidism. Sedentary lifestyle. Bone health begins in childhood. Children who are physically active and consume adequate amounts of calcium-containing foods have the greatest bone density. All weight-bearing exercise is beneficial, but jumping and hopping seems particularly helpful for creating healthy bones. Exercise throughout life is important, can increase the bone density at any age. Chronic alcoholism. For men, alcoholism is one of the leading risk factors for osteoporosis. Excess consumption of alcohol reduces bone formation and interferes with the body's ability to absorb calcium. Osteomalacia. The most common cause of osteomalacia is a deficiency of vitamin D. Vitamin D insufficiency can cause osteomalacia because vitamin D facilitates calcium absorption and other minerals in the gastrointestinal tract necessary for bone building. Lack of vitamin D, calcium, and other minerals are an absorbed deficiency, so they are not available for mineralization in the bone building process. This then results in soft bones. So insufficient sunlight exposure. Sunlight makes vitamin D in the skin. Therefore, osteomalacia can develop in people who spend little time in the sunlight, wear very strong sunscreen, live in areas where sunlight hours are short, or where air is smoggy. Insufficient vitamin D intake. A diet low in vitamin D is the most common cause seen worldwide. It is less common in the U.S. because many foods such as milk and cereals are fortified with vitamin D. Certain surgeries. The removal of part or all of a stomach known as a gastrectomy can lead to this disease because the stomach breaks down food to release vitamin D and other minerals which are then absorbed by the intestine. 
Surgery movement or bypass in the small intestine can lead to osteomalacia. Chronic pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is a long-standing inflammation of the pancreas, an organ that makes digestive enzymes and hormones. If the pancreas is inflamed, enzymes in charge of breaking down food and releasing nutrients do not flow as freely into the intestine. Chronic sprue. In this autoimmune disorder, the lining of the small intestine is damaged by consuming foods having gluten, a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. Damaged intestinal lining doesn't absorb nutrients such as vitamin D as well as healthy one would. The symptoms of Paget's disease depend on the bones affected and the severity of the disease. And large bones can pinch adjacent nerves, causing tingling and numbness. Bowing of the legs can occur. Biphosphonates are commonly used medications to treat osteoporosis and increase bone density, but they also use them to reduce the activity of Paget's disease. Treatment with these agents helps restore more normal appearing bone and may produce long-term remission of Paget's disease. Biphosphonates are currently the treatment of choice for Paget's, but can't take them if having serious kidney disease. Some biphosphonates are given as oral medication, while others are given intravenously. Oral biphosphonates are generally well tolerated but may irritate the gastrointestinal tract. Intravenous administration offers a more rapid response than oral medication. Calcitonin. If can't tolerate biphosphonates, then calcitonin, a naturally occurring hormone involved in calcium regulation and bone metabolism, may be ordered. Gout is a complex form of arthritis characterized by sudden severe attacks of pain, redness, and tenderness in joints, often the joint at the base of the big toe. Gout can affect anyone. Men are more likely to get gout, but women are becoming increasingly susceptible to gout after menopause. An acute attack of gout can feel like the big toe is on fire. The affected joint is hot and swollen and so tender that even the weight of a sheet on it is, seems intolerable. Gout occurs when uric crystals accumulate around a joint, causing the inflammation and intense pain of a gout attack. Uric crystals can form when having high levels of uric acid in the blood. The body produces uric acid when it breaks down purines, substances that are found naturally in the body, as well as certain foods such as organ meats, like liver, anchovies, herring, asparagus, and mushrooms. Normally, uric acid dissolves in the blood and passes through the kidneys into urine, but sometimes the body either produces too much uric acid or the kidneys excrete too little uric acid. When this happens, uric acid can build up, forming sharp needle-like urate crystals in the joint or surrounding tissue that cause pain, inflammation, and swelling. Different medications are prescribed to treat acute gout attacks and prevent future attacks. The goal is to reduce the risk of gout complications such as deposits of urate crystals that cause nodules to form under the skin, the tophi. Medications are the most proven effective way to treat gout symptoms. However, making certain changes to the diet also may help. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may control inflammation and pain in people with gout. Colchicine. If unable to take non-steroidals after a gout attack resolves, the patient may receive a low daily dose of colchicine to prevent future attacks. Corticosteroid medications such as prednisone may control gout inflammation and pain. Corticosteroids may be administered in pill form or they can be injected into the joint. Corticosteroids are generally reserved for people who can't take either non-steroidals or colchicine. Medications that block uric acid production, drugs like xanthine oxidase inhibitors, including allopurinol, so xyloprim, allopurinol, and febustat, ulric, limit the amount of uric acid the body makes. This may lower the blood's uric acid level and reduce the risk of gout. Side effects of allopurinol include a rash and low blood counts. Xanthine oxidase inhibitors may trigger a new acute attack if taken before a recent attack has totally resolved. Taking a short course of low-dose colchicine before taking a xanthine oxidase inhibitor has been found to significantly reduce this risk. Medications that improve uric acid removal, probenicid or probalin, improves the kidney's ability to remove uric acid from the body. This may lower the uric acid levels and reduce the risk of gout, but the level of uric acid in the urine is increased. Side effects include a rash, stomach pain, and kidney stones. Osteoarthritis, sometimes called degenerative joint disease or osteoarthrosis, is the most common form of arthritis. 
Osteoarthritis symptoms often develop slowly and worsen over time. Signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis include pain, the joint may hurt during or after movement, tenderness, the joint may feel tender when applying light pressure to it, stiffness, joint stiffness may be most noticeable when waking up in the morning or after a period of inactivity, loss of flexibility, may not be able to move the joint through its full range of motion, grating sensation, may hear or feel a grating sensation when using the joint, or bone spurs. These extra bits of bones, which feel like hard bumps, may form around the affected joint. Signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis include joint pain and joint swelling, joints are tender to touch, red and puffy hands, firm bumps of tissue under the skin on arms for rheumatoid nodules, fatigue, morning stiffness that lasts at least 30 minutes, fever, and weight loss. Signs and symptoms appear in smaller joints first. Rheumatoid arthritis usually causes problems in several joints at the same time. Early rheumatoid arthritis tends to affect the smaller joints first, the joints in the wrists, hands, ankles, and feet. As the disease progresses, the shoulders, elbows, knees, hips, jaw, and neck can also become involved. Signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis flare up. Rheumatoid arthritis signs and symptoms may vary in, in severity and may even come and go. Periods of increased disease activity called flare-ups or flares alternate with periods of relative remission during which the swelling, pain, difficulty sleeping, and weakness fade or disappear. Rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory form of arthritis that causes joint pain and damage. Rheumatoid arthritis attacks the lining of the joints, the synovium, causing swelling that can result in aching and throbbing and eventually deformity. Sometimes rheumatoid arthritis symptoms make even the simplest activities, such as opening a jar or taking a walk, difficult to manage. There's no cure for rheumatoid arthritis. With proper treatment, a strategy for joint protection and changes in lifestyle can live a long, productive life with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis occurs when white blood cells, whose usual job is to attack unwanted invaders, such as bacteria and viruses, move from the bloodstream into the membranes that surround the joints, the synovium. The blood cells appear to play a role in causing the synovium to become inflamed. The inflammation causes the release of proteins that, over months or years, cause the synovium to thicken. The proteins can also damage the cartilage, bone, tendons, and ligaments near the joint. Gradually, the joint loses its shape and alignment, and eventually it may become destroyed. If you look at this picture, you'll see a normal joint on the left. In the middle is osteoarthritis. Notice that the bone ends rub together. To the right is rheumatoid arthritis, and notice the swollen, inflamed synovial membrane. Muscular dystrophy. The cause of muscular dystrophy is not definitively known. Electrical muscle stimulus treatment would not affect muscular dystrophy. It is a generative muscular disorder, not a nerve disorder, which affects the ability to perform activities of daily living. This condition is not felt to be caused by infectious organisms. Symptoms vary with different types of muscular dystrophy. Certain types, such as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, are ultimately fatal, while other types have associated muscle weakness but cause little disability. Because these are inherited disorders, risks include a family history of muscular dystrophy. Diagnosis is usually made through an EMG, electromyogram, a test in which the electrical activity in muscle is analyzed after being amplified, displayed, and recorded. Osteomyelitis. It's a medical term for infection in the bone. Infections can reach a bone by traveling through the bloodstream or spreading from nearby tissue. Most cases of osteomyelitis are caused by Staphylococcus bacteria, a type of germ commonly found on the skin or in the nose of even healthy individuals. Germs can enter a bone in a variety of ways, including by the bloodstream, for example, pneumonia or urinary tract infection. Bacteria can travel through the bloodstream to a weakened spot in the bone. In children, osteomyelitis most commonly occurs in the softer areas called growth plates at either end of the long bones of the arms and legs. Severe puncture wounds can carry germs deep inside the body. If such an injury becomes infected, the bacteria can spread into a nearby bone. Direct contamination may occur if bone is broken so severely that part of it is sticking out through the skin. Direct contamination also can occur during surgeries to replace joints or repair fractures. Osteomyelitis complications may include bone death, osteonecrosis. 
An infection of the bone can impede circulation within the bone, leading to bone death. The bone can heal after surgery to remove small sections of dead bone. If a large section of the bone has died, the patient may need to have the limb amputated to prevent the spread of the infection. In septic arthritis, in some cases, infection within bones can spread into a nearby joint. Skin cancer. If the osteomyelitis has resulted in an open sore that is draining pus, the surrounding skin is at higher risk of developing squamous cell cancer. Medication. A bone biopsy will reveal what type of bacteria is causing the infection, so the physician may choose an antibiotic that works particularly well for that type of infection. The antibiotics are usually administered through a vein in the arm for at least six weeks. Side effects may include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Surgery. Depending on the severity of the infection, osteomyelitis surgery may include one or more of the following procedures. Drain the affected area. Opening up the area around the affected bone allows the surgeon to drain any pus or fluid that has accumulated in response to the infection. Remove disease bone and tissue. In a procedure called debridement, the surgeon removes as much of the disease bone as possible, taking a small margin of healthy bone to ensure that all the affected areas have been removed. Surrounding tissues that show signs of infection also may be removed. Restore blood flow to the bone. The surgeon may feel an empty space left by the debridement procedure with a piece of bone or other tissue, such as skin or muscle, from another part of the body. Sometimes temporary fillers are placed in the pocket until healthy enough to undergo a bone graft or tissue graft. The graft helps the body repair damaged blood vessels and form new bone. Remove any foreign objects. In some cases, foreign objects, such as surgical plates or screws placed during a previous surgery, may have to be removed. Amputate the limb. As a last resort, surgeons may amputate the affected limb to stop the infection from spreading further. Hyperbaric oxygen, adjunctive therapy, aggressive surgical debridement, parenteral antibiotics, and nutritional support improve patient outcomes. Hyperbaric oxygen should be initiated immediately following surgical debridement of infected bones. Hyperbaric oxygen promotes angiogenesis, increased leukocyte killing and aminoglycoside transport across bacterial cell walls and osteoclast activity in removing necrotic bone. Septic arthritis may develop when an infection elsewhere in the body, such as an upper respiratory tract infection or urinary tract infection, spreads through the bloodstream to a joint. Less commonly, a puncture wound, drug injection, or surgery near a joint may allow bacteria into the joint. The lining of the joints, the synovium, has little to protect itself from infection. Once bacteria reach the synovium, they enter easily and can begin destroying cartilage. The body's reaction to the bacteria is causing inflammation around the joint, increasing pressure in the joint, and reducing blood flow to the joint. Contributes to, ah, we have it, the damage to the joint. A number of strains of bacteria can cause septic arthritis. The most common type involved in septic arthritis is Staphylococcus aureus, a staph, a type of bacteria commonly found on the skin and in the nose. In the past, septic arthritis was more frequently caused by the bacterium that causes the sexually transmitted disease gonorrhea. But use of safer sex practices has led to the decline in gonorrhea and its complication, including septic arthritis. Still, in younger, sexually active people, gonorrhea is a potential cause of septic arthritis. Bacteria are just one cause of joint infections. Viruses can attack joints like viral arthritis, though this condition usually resolves on its own and causes little joint damage. In rare cases, joint infections can be caused by a fungus, a fungal arthritis. Another infectious type of arthritis is reactive arthritis, which causes joint pain in response to an infection in another part of the body, though the joint itself isn't affected. Scoliosis is a sideway curvature of the spine that occurs most often during a growth spurt just before puberty. While scoliosis can be caused by conditions such as cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophy, the cause of most scoliosis is unknown. Most cases of scoliosis are mild, but severe scoliosis can be disabling. An especially severe spinal curve can reduce the amount of space within the chest, making it difficult for the lungs to function properly. Children who have mild scoliosis are monitored closely, usually with x-rays, to see if the curve is getting worse. In many cases, no treatment is necessary. Some children will need to wear a brace to stop the curve from worsening. Others may need surgery to straighten severe cases of scoliosis. 
Risk factors for developing the most common type of scoliosis include age, signs and symptoms typically beginning during a growth spurt that occurs again just before puberty, sex. Although both boys and girls develop mild scoliosis at the same rate, girls have a much higher risk of the curve worsening and requiring treatment. Family history. Scoliosis tends to run in families. Kyphosis may cause the following complications. Kyphosis is a forward rounding of the upper back. Some rounding is normal, but the term kyphosis usually refers to an exaggerated rounding more than 50 degrees. This deformity is also called round back or hunchback. With kyphosis, the spine may look normal or may develop a hump. Kyphosis can occur as a result of developmental problems, degenerative diseases such as arthritis of the spine, and osteoporosis with compression fracture of the vertebra or trauma to the spine. It can affect all ages. Mild kyphosis can cause few problems, but severe cases can affect the lungs, nerves, and other tissues and organs, causing pain and other problems. Treatment for kyphosis depends on the age, the cause of the curvature, and its effect. Although rare, kyphosis can lead to serious health problems such as physical deformity, breathing difficulties, or damage to internal organs that are affected by the postural changes. Causes in adults. Disorders that may cause a curvature of the spine in adults resulting in kyphosis include osteoporosis, a bone thinning disease that's associated with fractures of the vertebra which cause compression of the spine and contribute to kyphosis. Degenerative arthritis of the spine, which can cause deterioration of the bone and disc of the spine. Onkylosing spondylitis, an inflammatory arthritis that affects the spine and nearby joints. Connective tissue disorders, such as Marfan syndrome, that may affect the connective tissue's ability to hold joints in their proper position. Tuberculosis and other infections of the spine, which can result in destruction of joints. Cancer or benign tumors that impinge on bones of the spine and force them out of position. Spina bifida, a birth defect in which the spine doesn't form completely and which causes defects of the spinal cord and vertebra. Conditions that cause paralysis, such as cerebral palsy and polio, and that stiffen the bones of the spine. Acute low back pain. Several risk factors are lack of muscle tone, excess body weight, poor posture, cigarette smoking, stress. Low back pain is associated with prolonged periods of sitting, repetitive heavy lifting, vibration. Affects about 80% of adults in the United States at least once. Second only to headache as the most common pain complaint. In persons under age 45, low back is responsible for more lost working hours. Low back pain, common because lumbar region bears most of the weight of the body. Few definitive diagnosis abnormalities are present with paravertebral muscle strain. One test is straight leg raise, which is positive for disc herniation when radicular pain occurs. Generally, MRI and CT are not done unless trauma or systemic disease is suspected. Chronic low back pain. As people age, bone strength and muscle elasticity and tone tend to decrease. The discs begin to lose fluid and flexibility, which decreases their ability to cushion the vertebra. Pain can occur when, for example, someone lifts something too heavy or overstretches, causing a sprain, strain, or spasm in one of the muscles or ligaments in the back. If the spine becomes overly strained or compressed, a disc may rupture or bulge outward. This rupture may put pressure on one or more than 50 nerves rooted in the spinal cord that control body movements and transmit signals from the body to the brain. When these nerve roots become compressed or irritated, back pain results. Low back pain may reflect nerve or muscle irritation or bone lesions. Most low back pain follows injury or trauma to the back but pain may also be caused by degenerative conditions such as arthritis or disc disease, osteoporosis or other bone diseases, viral infection, irritation to joint and disc, or congenital abnormalities in the spine. Obesity, smoking, weight gain during pregnancy, stress, poor physical condition, posture inappropriate for the activity being performed, and poor sleeping position also may contribute to low back pain. Additionally, scar tissue created when the injured back heals itself does not have the same strength or flexibility of normal tissue. Build up of scar tissue from repeated injuries eventually weakens the back and can lead to more serious injury. Occasionally, low back pain may indicate a more serious medical problem. Pain accompanied by fever or loss of bowel or bladder control, pain when coughing and progressive weakness in the legs may indicate a pinched nerve or other serious condition. People with diabetes may have severe back pain or pain radiating down the leg related to neuropathy. 
common foot disorders. A bunion is an abnormal bony bump that forms on the joint at the base of the big toe. This big toe becomes enlarged, forcing the toe to crowd against the other toes. This puts pressure on the big toe joint, pushing it outward beyond the normal profile of the foot and resulting in pain. Bunions develop over time due to abnormal motion and pressure on the big toe joint. Bunions also can occur on the joint of the little toe, a bunion net. Causes of bunions include high-heeled or ill-fitting shoes, inherited foot type, foot injuries, deformities present at birth, which would be congenital. Bunions may be associated with various forms of arthritis, including inflammatory or degenerative forms, causing the protective cartilage that covers the big toe joint to deteriorate. An occupation that puts extra stress on feet or wearing pointed shoes also can be a cause. For example, dancers and cowboys are more prone to developing bunions. Common foot disorders. A hammer toe occurs when the toe, usually the second toe, bends down at the middle toe joint, the proximal interphalangeal joint, or called the pip. The toe may bend up at the joint where the toe and foot meet, the metatarsophalangeal joint, or MTP, causing the middle toe joint to be raised slightly. There may also be a deformity of the distal interphalangeal joint, the dip. The claw toe often affects all toes at the same time, except the big toe, causing them to bend downward at both the middle joints, the PIP joints. And the joints nearest the tip, the distal interphalangeal joint again, or DIP, so that the toes curl down. The toes bend up at the joints where the toes and the foot meet, the MTP joint. A mallet toe often affects the longest toe, generally the second toe, but it may affect the other toes as well. The toe pins down at the joint closest to the tip. That's the dip joint. <laughs> Relieving the pain and pressure of hammer toe and mallet toe may involve changing the footwear and wearing shoe insoles. A more severe case of hammer toe or mallet toe may need surgery to experience relief. A common cause of hammer toe and mallet toe is wearing improper footwear, shoes that are too tight in the toe box, or high heel shoes. Wearing shoes of either type can push the toes forward, crowding one or more into a space that's not large enough to allow the toes to lie flat. Morton's neuroma. This condition seems to occur in response to irritation, pressure, or injury to one of the digital nerves that lead to the toes. The growth of thickened nerve tissue, neuroma, is part of the body's response to the irritation or injury. Factors that appear to contribute to Morton's neuroma include wearing high heel shoes or shoes that are tight or ill-fitting, including those that box in the feet and place pressure on the toes. High impact athletic activities such as jogging that may subject the feet to repetitive trauma. In some cases, Morton's neuroma may result from abnormal movement of the foot caused by bunions, hammer toes, flat feet, or excessive flexibility. In some cases, there's no clear cause of pressure or irritation.